2015. It was a very good year. When Frank Sinatra sang It Was a Very Good Year, the first line was, When I was 17. The Micro Four Third system is less than half that age. October 2015 marks seven years from the introduction of the Panasonic G1, the first Micro Four Third system camera. Staying with the crooner's theme, as Bing Crosby sang, it must have been a beautiful baby, because baby look at it now. It has matured, but it is not getting old and sticking the mud. It is still innovating, and many of the items I have reviewed reflect that innovation. One surprise, looking back to the G1 in 2008, was that it did not do video. Today's Micro Four Thirds commonly do 4K video. It's a step too far for some, but it's emblematic of the way that mirrorless cameras, and MFT in particular, can stay ahead of the game rather than follow others. But innovation is more than just doing new things. Take my first review of 2015, the Panasonic 35-100mm f4-5.6. Nothing new in itself, but this one telescopes in for an overall length of just over 2 inches, 5 centimeters for carrying. That is new. It's stabilised, weighs 135 grams, and feels solid and well built. But the best thing is that you can happily shoot wide open. At 100mm, for edge sharpness you might want to stop down to f8, but you need to be quite critical to feel it was necessary. While it was designed for the tiny Panasonic GM1 and 5 cameras, it performs well enough and is small enough to merit a place in anyone's camera bag. Or pocket, really. Then came the Metabones adapter. According to the blurb, it would turn a 300mm lens into a 210mm and double the speed. So a 200mm f4 would become a 140mm f2.8, with a 7.5 degree angle of view, similar to a 280mm on a full frame, and it would increase, not decrease, image resolution. Pull the other one, it's got bells on, I thought. Swiftly followed by a loud ringing sound. It really does work. And if you have certain Canon lenses, I understand you could even retain autofocus and exposure. Then came the Olympus EM5 Mark II. It's as if Olympus had been reading everyone's letters. It has a fully articulated screen, a stabilisation system that threatened to put Manfrotto out of business. It's dustproof, splashproof and freezeproof. It has an electronic shutter with a 16,000th top speed, and a special 40 megapixel high resolution setting for still subjects, plus headphone and microphone sockets and high bitrate video. For me it had everything I wanted except one thing. It was too small and my not very big hands kept changing the settings. I fitted a grip to it, but while it was better, it still felt ungainly. I was going to chainsaw the body, take out the innards and put them in an EM1 body, but Olympus pointed out that that might invalidate the warranty, and I would be better off taking an angle grinder to my fingers. Seriously, if you find the M5 2 size works for you, it's hard to see why you'd buy anything else. Next, one of my highlights of the year, the Olympus 40 to 150mm f2.8 Pro Zoom. I started out prejudiced. This was a step in the wrong direction, just too big, and a denial of the Micro Four Thirds unique selling point, compact equipment. It soon won me over. Viewed in context, this lens isn't big at all. No other interchangeable lens camera system has an optic combining this angle of view with an f2.8 aperture. It can't be done. It doesn't replace one lens, it replaces two, or three, if you buy the highly capable 1.4x converter with it. If you feel that it is too big in an absolute sense, you could buy a Panasonic 35-100-2.8. But there's no matching 150mm 2.8, and even if there were, added to the other lens, it wouldn't weigh any less. Early reports suggested that this was a miracle of the lens maker's art, but I've been around too long to take such hype seriously. This 40 to 150 is at the very top end of what I would have thought possible for such a lens. Where it is less than excellent, it is confined to the edges. It's beautifully made and silky smooth to operate. It's one of the great lenses of any system and a tribute to Olympus's design and engineering. Then there were the two Panasonic introductions, the 42.5mm f1.7 and the 30mm f2.8 macro. The 42.5mm has tough competition from Olympus's by MFT standards venerable 45mm f1.8. The 42.5mm focuses faster and has stabilisation, and is certainly better for users of Panasonic camera bodies with no inbuilt stabilisation. It's a lot cheaper and more handy than its big brother 42.5mm f1.2, though it lacks the charisma and ultimate depth of field control of that lens. 
For myself, stabilisation isn't that important for short fast telly, which I mainly use for portraits, so I have stuck with my 45mm Olympus. The 30mm f2.8 is a bit of a strange one for me. It is optically superb right from f2.8 and has the required lack of distortion for a lens that may well be used for technical purposes like copying documents. But since I quite like snapping away at bugs, and getting close enough to fill the frame with a 30mm involves practically sticking it up their proboscis, and since further I don't like getting bitten while I do it, I'll stick with my 16mm Olympus. I'd say that 45mm is the absolute minimum focal length for macro, especially if you want to use ring light or a flash. Which brings me to my other highlight of the year, the Panasonic GX8. The moment I picked this up, like the GH4 and the GX7, it just felt right. It reminded me of a film camera in its simplicity, which is absurd because it has the same plethora of controls and dials and buttons as any modern digital camera. But it doesn't feel that way. On a day shoot out and about, I use RAW files with aperture priority. The only things I will change frequently will be the ISO and aperture plus exposure compensation. Having a physically marked, dedicated compensation dial to hand is a masterstroke of ergonomics, as is a switch with focus mode plus marked functions for drive mode, AF mode and ISO on the rear cursors. Olympus's 12 to 40 and 40 to 150 f2.8 zooms feel like they were made for this camera. Like them, the GX8 feels substantial, strong, reliable. It's a real shooting tool, and to my surprise, the in-body stabilisation makes the long telly a perfectly usable proposition. Used with one of the Panasonic lenses that will sync its stabilisation with the body stabilisation, the GX8 is up there with the Olympuses as a tripod killer. The brand new 20 megapixel sensor, the biggest in Micro Four Thirds, and the best in MFT, is a bonus, as is the superb electronic viewfinder. The M1 and 5 Mark II's finders are superb, as good as anyone needs. This is even better. I can't imagine anyone coming to this from an optical finder and wanting to revert. The icing on the cake is Panasonic's easily navigated menu system. Its clarity and logic are an object lesson for other camera makers. The next in line was a little different for me, the Panasonic LX100. I started out treating it as a candidate for a second or take anywhere camera to back up a main MFT camera. What I found was that without the ability to change lenses, I felt hobbled. The camera is amazing and treated as a step up from a compact is up there with any Sony or Fuji. But much as an F17 24mm equivalent angle of view lens is attractive and as good as its performance is all through the range, I prefer a GX7 with a 12 to 32 and 35 to 100 mini zooms. It doesn't take much more space, but offers so much more versatility. Nonetheless, if my son or daughter just wanted to step up to proper photography from their smartphones, this LX100 is where I'd buy them. For myself, this would be a camera to keep in the glove box of my car, so that it was always to hand for a quick shot, but I'm not that rich. Right now I'm using a G7 Panasonic, which will be my first review of the new year. I wonder if we'll see any M2 or a GH5 in the new year. Exciting times. Thanks for watching.